I call heaven in my heart because heaven doesn't start when you die. Heaven starts now. When you ask Jesus into your life, heaven starts now. You can have heaven in your heart every moment of every day. His name is the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and you don't have to wait till you die. You can have heaven right now. Now, most of us believe in heaven, but very few of us know anything about it, don't we? Is that true? So you better come the next few weeks because you'll learn a lot. Um, we know it's better than hell. But we're not really sure what that means. We just know that given the choice, we'd choose heaven over hell, wouldn't we? I hope you said yes to that. So I want to explore what heaven really is biblically, what it isn't, and why we should get excited about it. John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. If you have your Bible there, please open to John chapter 14. Uh, if you have this memorized, then good for you. That's fantastic. Uh, if, if not, we have notes in our Bible app. On the Bible app is also the Bible, but we also have the notes for this message on our Bible app. So if you have the Bible app, if you open up to, I think it's messages there, and you'll see all the notes there, you can fill it in. You can email yourself, because this is pretty important stuff, wouldn't you say? In the light of eternity, we should know something about eternity. And mostly we don't. This is what Jesus said in John 14, starting at verse 1. Let, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may, you may all be also. Where I am, there you may be also. Lord, I pray that you would just enlighten your scriptures. You will give us a glimpse of heaven. As we sang holy, we, we sense the presence of heaven. But Lord, we want, it to, we want to understand and we want to get excited because this is what drives us on through life if we know where we're going. So Lord, I pray that you would speak to us over these next few weeks and open our hearts that we might receive what your word says in Jesus' name. You know, Jesus gave us a glimpse of heaven so, uh, so that we would not be, tr not be troubled. In this life, he said, we would have many troubles, but when we die, we will have peace. John 16, 33, Jesus said, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. We can have peace in our hearts because we can have heaven in our hearts today. Now, this morning, I thought I'd copied this, 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 uh, all these visuals and stuff across onto my little thumb drive and apparently I hadn't, so I had to rush back to my house and then rush back here before church started. Now, I don't know if I've got to arrange this, but the slowest drivers in the world, <laughs> the maximum number of lights, and, and honestly, I, I mean, all due respect, I got behind some drivers who think that the speed limit is kryptonite and they need to keep as far away from it as they possibly can. So here I am in a hurry and we're doing 50 in an 80 zone. And we're doing 40 in a 60 zone and there's nowhere to overtake. And I just laughed and I said, Lord, I'm just going to have to get your peace from this because I can't get around this person. There and back. Twice. Because God has a terrific sense of humor. And he's just like, yeah, you're enjoying that, aren't you? And I said, mm, yeah. See, in this life, we will not have peace. In this life, we will have trouble. We'll have tribulation. Things will go wrong. How many of you know things go wrong? They do sometimes. You don't get everything you pray for. You don't, everything you desire, you don't get. This is what this life is like. We will have trouble. People will attack us. As Kenny said, people will betray us. They'll let us down. But we have to believe there is something more than what we see around us in this life. Yes? So I hope you get excited about this uh, message series. Most human civilizations believe in an afterlife. And most talk about a blissful place where we can rest in peace. You see it written on headstones, R.I.P., rest in peace. We hope to at least rest in peace. What we're saying is we hope this person's death is better than what their life was. And it's not always true. Uh, we, we call it heaven. So, some, you know, different religions call it different things. We, we must, I mean... On the bulk of evidence, you'd have to say there's something out there, wouldn't you? I mean, some people call it uh, paradise. Some people call it nirvana. There's all sorts of things that people call it. Early Christians, did you know, clearly had a preoccupation with heaven. 
Roman catacombs have walls, uh, pictures on the walls and inscriptions detailing heavenly landscapes, children playing, feasts and banquets and all that sort of stuff. And what they based it on were the thoughts of, the, of, of what St. Paul had shared in 2 Corinthians 5. He said this, So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. So Paul said, look, uh, you know, it's better that I was in heaven. But I'm going to stay in this body because there's still work to be done. I'd rather be there. But whether I'm here, whether I'm there, or whatever I do, I want to please God. And I hope that's your attitude. Whatever we do, we want to be pleasing God. So talking about and understanding what heaven teaches about, sorry, what the Bible teaches about heaven should encourage us in our day-to-day walk. We should think, well, you know, we're going to a place that is, we can get excited about. Keith Green, who currently resides in heaven, um, he wrote a great song that encourages us to believe that heaven is amazingly amazing. One of the big lies the devil's going to try and sell you is that heaven's boring. And it's not. Heaven is amazing on a scale we can't even imagine. Listen to what Keith Green wrote. He's experiencing this right now. He wrote this. I can't wait to get to heaven when you, Jesus, wipe away all our tears. In six days you created everything, but you've been working on heaven 2,000 years. Think about it. Think of the best that we could see out there, the mountains, the beaches, you know, underwater, in the skies, you know, the incredible things we see in this world. This was six days' work. And God's been working on heaven for 2,000 years. The part of the problem here is that we all have a terminal disease. A Christian man was caring for his wife who was dying of cancer. She asked him one day, oh, sorry, he asked her one day, what's it like to wake up every morning knowing that you're dying? And she replied, what's it like to wake up every morning pretending you're not? Because we are all dying. Even you young people who feel nice and fit and good looking and all that sort of stuff, your body will wear out. I was once young. I was once fitter. I was never particularly good looking, but I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't, I was better than this. Because over time, things get worse. Have you noticed that? If you leave a house, to itself, it just, you know, if you leave a garden to itself, weeds grow. If you leave a house to itself, there's, there's you know, cracks appear. And it, everything gets worse with age except wine and women. <laughs> wives in particular. No, seriously, wives get better with age. They do. Well, mine does. So you can take it up with yours later on. Um, but the fact is, Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden and mankind sinned. And we have to deal with the result of that sin, which is death. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. So when Adam and Eve sinned, they brought death into the picture. Everybody sins, and the penalty for that sin is that everybody deserves to die. You deserve to die. I deserve to die. We all deserve to die. We will die physically. Our body will die physically. We all deserve to die spiritually and go to hell. That's what we all deserve. But God, in his graciousness, he, he, he brought something called the gospel, the good news, which is that Jesus came to earth and paid the price for our sin for us so that we don't have to face that second death. This is not a new gospel. This is the gospel, right? The hope of he- that We can have a hope of heaven in our hearts right this day, right this moment. We don't have to say, gee, I hope I make it. Because, see, what, what Jesus did was he paid the price for us. He, you know, he, we don't tally up our good and our bad at the end of the day and say, well, I hope good is better than bad and then I get into heaven. That's what most people think. But that's not true. Because what God did was he, he says, well, if I tally up good versus bad, if you've got any bad at all, you fail. And you're destined to hell. That means every single person on earth is destined for hell. But God stepped in and gave his own son to pay the price for us. And that's how we attain heaven, on his graciousness, not on our efforts. King David wrote this. 
Psalm 39 verse 4. O Lord, make me know my end from what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. And so the encouragement is this, that what you see around you, what you call life, your life, the life of the people you love, that the Bible says it's like breathing vapor on a cold day. You breathe it out, you see it for a moment, then it's gone. Because in the scope of eternity, from, from time immeasurable backwards to time immeasurable forward, your life is really a moment. It's like a breath. So it makes sense that if our current life is like a brief, a brief blip, that we should discover something about what our entire life is going to be like right into eternity. Doesn't that make sense? So as Christians, we don't have to fear death because Jesus came, laid his life down to set us free from death, and he destroyed death's power over us. There's numerous verses about this. That could be the Lord. Um, <laughs> telling me to move on to the next passage. Eh? Hebrews 2, Jesus, it talks about Jesus. Through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. You see, if you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, you are a slave and you're a slave to something that's going to lead to death. You might say, I say people, oh, people say to me, oh, I don't want to be a Christian, I want to be free. You're not free. You're not. You're a slave to what you do, to what you say, to what you think. And that is going to send you to hell. How free is that? If you come to Christ and you give him all these things and you give your sin to him and he forgives you, then you are truly free. You don't have to look over your shoulder and wonder who's looking at me all the time, you know. You can truly be free this morning. But people who don't know Jesus are actually slaves to their own fear. Have you ever been to a funeral? Put your hand up if you've ever been to a funeral, right? Most of us have. We had one for, for Doug just a, a couple of weeks ago. Now, at a funeral, have you ever looked in the eyes of people who were there at the funeral? Especially those who don't know Christ. Doug's funeral was a celebration because he knew Jesus. And he's with Jesus right now. But many people, if you look in their eyes, they're terrified because they don't normally think about death. You don't get cards saying, Merry death, happy dying. Hope you have a nice time when you die. You know, we don't get that. We don't even talk about it. If we talk about, you know, if we talk about jokes, we, uh, jokes about death or something, we all get, we all get a, a bit sort of tense, you know, because people are fearful. They don't know what's going to happen. So I think... You know, that genuine fear that people have, we have the answer, and his name is Jesus. And the hope is heaven. So let's talk about what happens when we die. Now, 21st century man says it's all about science. And you'll be pleased to know, possibly not pleased to know, that there is no science that validates the data as to what happens when we die. So no matter who you are, rich or poor, successful or not, believer or not, if you have a, a, a bunch of university degrees or, or nothing at all, we all die and we all require some sort of faith because there is no verifiable scientific data. That we don't have anything that measures beyond the grave. We have anecdotes where people talking about they've had an experience, but we don't have any scientific proof. So if you're a scientific person, I don't care who you are, you've still got to have faith. You've got to have faith to believe some of the scientific theories. Because they're just theories. So whatever you do is going to require faith. So what do people say happens when we die? Well, number one, annihilation. Atheists and a few others believe that when you die, that's the end of it. So when you die, nothing. Zip. You're finished. Your body goes to, to, to dust and, and you're nothing. Now, it's really interesting that if you, if you Google the last words of atheists... Because there's a string of very famous atheists whose last words would belie the life that they lived and the things they believed and propagated. Uh, so, for example, Sir Thomas Scott, <coughs> his last words were, Until this moment, I thought there was neither God nor hell. Now I feel and know that there are both, and I am doomed to perdition by the just judgment of the Almighty. 
Robert Ingersoll, another atheist, said, O oh God, if there be a God, save my soul, if I have a soul, from hell, if there be a hell. He still didn't know, but he sensed something really bad was coming out there. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of a guy called Anton LaVey. He is the founder of the Satanic Church. He wrote the Satanic Bible, the quote-unquote Satanic Bible. His last words were, now, now this is a guy who was in league with Satan, there's no doubt, right? This is his last words. Listen to this. His last words were, before he died, oh my, oh my, what have I done? There is something very wrong. Okay, science can't measure it, but there is an abundance of anecdotal evidence that when we die, it's not the end. Something happens. Okay? And uh, many people, myself included, can attest to that. We had a glimpse, but only a glimpse. Second thing that people believe in is reincarnation. (coughs) Now, (coughs) reincarnation is an Eastern religion thing. It promotes the idea that there's a universal spirit, which is kind kind of God, and that we go through several lives over and over again. We repeat all our lives until ultimately we are good enough so that we can merge with the great nothingness and become nothing with it. It's a tr- tremendous aim, you know. And don't laugh because Shirley MacLaine's invested several lives trying to get this, all right? There is absolutely no evidence for this. Hindus and Buddhists and a few others believe this. But the Bible actually, this is one of the few ideas the Bible expressly speaks against. Hebrews 9.27, listen to this verse, important verse. Just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that the judgment. It doesn't say for man to die several times until he gets it right. So, so, you know, so the bad thing is you think, well, if you, know, if you believe in reincarnation, if I mess this life up, I'll come back as an ant and someone will squash me. You know, or if I get it right, I'll come back as a king. And you, you move up and down the various lives. Right? And, and, and what happens with that, Satan's actually harnessed that whole idea because in places like India where this idea is prevalent, you don't want to mess with someone else's karma because that would ruin your karma. Right? And so if someone is hurt or in pain or in trouble, you don't help them because helping them would be neutralizing what they need to suffer because they were bad in a previous life. And it would affect your next life. So we had a whole nation that up until Christianity came along, there were no proper hospitals, there were no orphanages. No one cared because the religion said you get another crack at life. And if you help this guy when he's down, you'll go backwards. (coughs) See how evil it is? Absolutely evil. The first orphanages, hospitals, schools, everything that were in India came in when the Christians came in because they care for people. And the others, it would mess with their karma. The Bible teaches that we get one life. Everybody say one life. One life. Just one. It's not a dress rehearsal. You can't die and come back like in a computer game. You know, you sit there and go, bang, oh, I'm dead. Oh, hang on. I'm back again. I can keep going. That's not what life's like. The Bible says one life. And after that, the judgment where you'll be called into account for everything you've done. Romans 14, 12. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. So annihilation certainly doesn't work because there's a lot of evidence that stuff's out there. Reincarnation is just completely made up. There is no evidence for that at all. The third one, which sometimes touches Christians, and, and several sects believe in this, is soul sleep. Now, some Christians believe that when we die, we all sleep. Because the Bible, when it talks about death, uses a, a figure of speech. Someone falling asleep is the same as dying. So some people say, well, when we die, we all sleep. And then later on, we will be resurrected and we will all face judgment. Now, to hold to this, yes, there's several passages that, talk, that use an analogy of sleep going to sleep with dying, but you've also got to ignore several other passages to make this one fly. So I don't think it's God at all. This view holds that we all sleep and we are resurrected to final judgment where believers go to heaven and the ungodly go to hell. 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 51 says this, Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That's a great verse on the rapture, when we all go to be with the Lord in the air, right? And so he's saying, we shall not all sleep. And so people say, well, maybe our soul sleeps when we die. 
Well, all of these theories, that one included, are based on some wild guesses or trying to sort of adapt things to, to extra, uh, explain strange paranormal events. But my question to you this morning is, what should we believe about death? It's not bad or wrong to talk about death. I think we should, don't you? We shouldn't just save it up for funerals. We should talk about it all the time. So what should we believe about death? We need some sort of a reliable standard that will tell us what actually happens when we die that we can rely on. Something that's never been wrong, something that's been proven right again and again, and we have that. The Bible, the Word of God, is our standard on what happens to us when we die. Not, gee, I feel like this happens when I die. So I want to ask you the question this morning, why bother learning about heaven? Well, as Christians, very few of us actually have a theology of heaven. We kind of know it's out there and we know it's better than hell, but we still have no idea what it involves. And I'm convinced that having a firm biblical idea of heaven should be a priority, especially if with the current events and the state of the world. People are terrified at the moment. They look at Israel, they look at Gaza, they're terrified of what can blow out of that. They look at, at, at a pandemic that's gone around the world. All these bad things that happen, I don't fear. I don't have fear of any of them. You know why? Because if any of them, or a car crash or anything else takes my life, I know where I'm going. I'm not living in fear. I don't, you know, I'm not saying I don't care. I care for other people. But I don't share that fear because I have this surety in my heart. Understanding heaven, having heaven in your heart, should encourage you to face this life. Colossians 3 says this. Verse 1, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Now the word seek in the Greek is interesting. It's the word zetio, which means to seek or crave or aim for. And the, the tense that it's in in the Greek is the present tense, which means seek and keep on seeking. Don't do it once, do it repeatedly. So what it means is that we as believers should keep on keeping on seeking the things above heaven, not earthly things. What Paul is saying there is everything you do, constantly think, keep seeking the things that are above, keep going, keep going, keep going. Don't give up. Don't do it once and say, well, I've done heaven. I've, I've thought about it. We should be thinking about it constantly. Philippians 1.20 121 for me to live is Christ and to die is gain so what advantage is correct theology well let me give read a little bit from Randy Alcorn who's written a fabulous book on this but he writes about Florence Chadwick in 1952 she was the first woman to swim the English Channel both ways and she attempted then to swim from Catalina Island off the California coast to the California mainland it was a cold foggy morning and Florence swam for 15 hours, kept going, kept going. And eventually she said, look, I just want to give up. Her mother was in the boat that was beside her. She said, don't give up. Don't give up. Keep going. She said, I can't do it. I'm done. And she gave up. She actually gave up less than a mile from her goal. At a later press conference, she said she could not see the shore because of the fog. And she said, if I could have seen the shore, I could have kept going. But she didn't know. It was fogged out, and so she gave up. And that's why we need to study and learn about heaven. Because if we can see the heavenly shore, we can keep going no matter what life throws at us. We can keep our eyes on that, set our mind on things above. We need a clear sight of heaven because it helps make, make this life more tangible. It helps us to keep going when things get tough. It helps us no matter what we face because our goal, the shore we are paddling towards, is heaven. So, the question to you this morning is, how do you see heaven? What do you think heaven is like? Do we become angels? Do we sit around bored for all eternity playing a harp on a cloud? Is heaven an endless church service, forever singing endless renditions of old hymns? If that's our view of heaven, little wonder we are unenthusiastic about talking about it. For most of us, our view of heaven is a collage of opinions that we've cut and pasted from several sources. Mainly, well, some of them Christian, not all, um, but very few are biblical. But we do mostly from movies, TV programs, books, and social media opinions. That's how we form our idea of heaven. We need to not do that 
because no one else knows what they're talking about either, including filmmakers, only God. The only definitive thing we know about heaven is that it's better than hell. And as Christians, we should know enough to shoot down the common uh, misconception, and you hear this all the time, that dead people grow wings and become angels. They don't. There is no evidence that that happens. If someone dies, oh, they're now my angel. No, they're not. There is no evidence that they, they grow wings and turn into angels at all. There's no biblical evidence. There's no evidence otherwise. It's just something they say to make you feel better. But it, it doesn't really make you feel better, ultimately, because it's not true. Shouldn't we build our life on truth and not a lie? I said this to Raymond the other night. I said, you know, we don't grow rings and become angels. He said, that's a pity. I'd really like some wings. <laughs> I said, I'll see what I can arrange. He just wants to fly, as do I, but not with angels' wings. Charles Spurgeon said this about his death. To come to thee is to come home to, from exile, to come to a land out of the raging storm, to rest after long labor, to come to the goal of my desires and the summit of my wishes. Now that is something worth talking about. Let me ask you, if you're planning a trip to somewhere far away, pick a destination like Europe or America or Asia, somewhere that you don't normally go, it's completely different. So you're planning a trip over there, you book a trip to Europe or something. Don't you get on the internet and research what's out there? Or do you just go, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to Europe, don't know what's there. Just going to turn up in Rome and go, wow. You, do, you, you know what you do? You plan it out, don't you? You research it. You find out where you want to stay. You, you find out all the attractions, the tourist attractions, that you do your research because, and then, doesn't that sustain you? You've got five weeks before you go, oh, man, I can't wait for this five weeks to go. I'm going to be off. I'm going to be off to Europe, you know. And so anywhere we go in our life, we plan out our, our, our way, we, you know, where we stay, what we can do when we get there, and it heightens the expectation of what's going to happen. If we are planning to go to heaven, why don't we research it and understand where we're going? Isn't that a great idea? Doesn't this heighten your expectations? So the purpose of this, this will probably be three or four weeks that I'll spend on this. It's not to discourage you, it's to encourage you to put heaven in your heart afresh so that you understand what happens when you die. So beware also of the heavenly lies. You see, Satan loves lying and he especially loves lying about heaven because it discourages us. Once we're saved, Satan can't unsave us. And so what he does is he tries to neutralize our effectiveness for the kingdom by discouraging us. And he always dresses up his lies so they look like truth. The skin of a lie stuffed with, sorry, the skin of truth stuffed with a lie. Now Jesus said this about Satan. John 8 verse 44, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. So the devil is going to try to lie to you about what is going to happen when you die. I found a really interesting verse in the book of Revelation. The satanic beast is described in this way. Revelation 13 verse 6. Listen to this. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling. That is those who dwell in heaven. You see, the devil would love to blaspheme God and his dwelling, heaven. Why? Because it sucks the wind out of your sails. It makes you, you get discouraged and flat and you don't want to serve the Lord. Randy Alcorn said this, Satan need not convince us that heaven doesn't exist. He needs only, only to convince us that heaven is a place of boring, unearthly existence. If we believe that lie, we will be robbed of our joy and anticipation. We'll set our minds on this life and not on the next and we won't be motivated to share our faith. Why should we share the good news that people can spend eternity in a boring, ghostly place that even we are not looking forward to? So if we don't get heaven right, we're not going to share the gospel with people. Why should we? We're bored about the thought of it. So let's explore heaven for a minute. Satan wants to suck you dry of any desire to be with your Lord in the place he's told you. Remember, right at the start, he's preparing a place for you. 
He wants to sap your hope. He wants to diffuse anything that you could become for the kingdom of God. But I want to diffuse him this morning, and I want to just briefly explore the truth about our eternal destination. Now, it's not, for many of you, it's not going to be where you think you're going, but we're going to explore that in coming weeks. But what, what we are fed in our society is a steady diet of what's called naturalism, the belief that the world can only be understood in scientific terms without recourse to spiritual or supernatural explanations. So in other words, what we see here is real. What we can't see is not real. And Satan, you know, Satan says to you, seeing is believing. But God says to you, believing is seeing. When you believe it, you begin to see it. It's very exciting. God made human beings both physical and spiritual. So it makes sense that heaven is not merely spiritual, but in some way physical. If we imagine heaven as dull and boring, there is no incentive to live with heaven in our hearts. But if we can imagine a true and biblical version of heaven, we can live with that in our hearts every day. So what is heaven going to be like? Here's a hint. The Apostle Paul wrote this, 1 Corinthians 2. Listen to this. As it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit touches everything, even the depths of God. You see, God, according to Paul, is preparing something that no eye has seen and no ear has heard and is off the charts, off the charts, exciting and fascinating. In my quiet time this week, I I was um, uh, studying in Mark. Uh, If you're doing the Bible reading plan, I hope you do that. Um, But I was studying in Mark. It says, uh, in Mark 6, 52, when Jesus was walking on the water and and, uh, the, the disciples saw him and And uh, it's interesting, they did the feeding of the 5,000 and then they saw Jesus walking on the water, he came in the boat, calmed the storm, all that sort of stuff. And then it harps back to the feeding of the 5,000 and says this, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. And I puzzled over that a little bit this week and it suddenly dawned on me, the disciples had just seen Jesus feeding 5,000 plus, probably up to 10 or 20,000 people, And they didn't expect Jesus to be walking on water and calming the storm because their hearts were hardened in the Greek puru, which means calloused, petrified, covered with hardened skin. And it occurred to me that those of us who are believers who've lived and served God a while, after a while, we're prone to get a little bit calloused, aren't we? We're prone to get same old, same old. Familiarity breeds contempt. You know, I've played the guitar for a long time. But I guarantee if I play the guitar and you play the guitar, that your fingers are going to hurt way before mine do. You know why? Because I have callus, calluses on the end of my fingers through so much playing. I've done it so often and for so long that I don't have any feeling left. It's got hard. And that's what it's like sometimes when we're in church and we're around church. We just go through the same things over and over again and our heart just becomes hard. And I think we need to say to the Lord, you know what? I want a soft, supple heart, don't you? I want to listen to, I want to understand, I want to be everything you want me to be. Not familiarity breeds contempt. Church, we must never lose the wonder, the awe, the, the being overwhelmed by the blessings of God. Don't become hardened because heaven is what God is preparing for us. And it is going to, listen to me, it is going to be mind-bogglingly off the charts exciting. I'm not just saying that. I think it's, an, it's going to be an amazing experience. So over the next few weeks, I'm going to ask you to dive into heaven with me. Um, the devil's going to sell you this, this heaven is boring thing, right? He's going to say it's an endless church service, singing old hymns. Every hymn has 58,000 verses. You know the ones. That's what it's like. Or you're going to be sitting on a cloud playing a harp until your fingers bleed. That's what he's going to sell you. That is not true. And uh, I don't believe any of those satanic lies. Heaven is going to be exciting, glorious, wonderful, and endlessly interesting. So what's an analogy that I could use? And I thought this was a great analogy. I actually love, does anyone here like snorkeling? 
I love snorkeling. And then I've also done some scuba diving. And the first time I went scuba diving, I remember going down under the water and you go down, you know, 10 metres, 15 metres, whatever. You're under the water, there's a lot of water on top of you. I never wanted to look up because it's a long way down. But I tell you, what's down there is completely different to what's up here. Like I remember the first time I dived, sitting there, I, and uh, Bill Newman, my friend, said, what was it like when you dived? I said, it was like being in the Garden of Eden. I mean, you look, you can't see anything you recognize. It's incredible colors, incredible shapes, coral and fish and stuff like that. It was amazing. It was like being in the Garden of Eden. I couldn't tell you the name of any of those things, but they were amazing. Different sizes, shapes. It, it, it was just incredible, fascinating fish. And it's something you never see on the surface. It was just like a whole new world. I think that's what heaven's going to be like. It's going to be fresh. It's going to be alive, colorful. It's going to be everything that you can imagine. And then when you think you've seen it all, you'll come around a little coral shelf and there's a fish you've, you've never even seen before in colors you've never seen before. And it will just roll on and on and on endlessly. Fascinating and amazing. That's what I believe heaven is going to be like. Constantly exciting. New, fascinating, interesting. It won't be playing harps on clouds. It won't be boring. Heaven will be beyond the greatest journey you can possibly imagine. And folks, when we die, we go to heaven. It's only the start. It gets better from there. How exciting is that? In this series, I won't have all the answers. No one has. But some things will remain hidden from our limited view. In Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of the Lord. So some things are going to remain secret. But nevertheless, God looks forward to blowing our minds. Can you imagine that? I've got you all excited to die here, haven't I? This is going to be amazing, you know. But God looks forward to blowing your mind. When you, like he's, what he's got for us is off the charts. He's revealed just enough about heaven to encourage us to trust him and to get us excited. And we will discover that heaven's not the end point. It gets even better. Heaven's like the launching pad for what he has to come. So I want to encourage you to come back over the next few weeks because we're about to embark on an incredible, awe-inspiring journey about, to find out the truth about heaven, hell, and what comes after death, where our eternal destination is. This will encourage us. It will give us hope to face the new year and give us courage to share our faith with others. And mankind's thought about this for a long time. And everybody has different theories. But even Hollywood, even TV shows have ideas about this. And I, something popped in my mind. And I'm going to read to you the prologue to a popular TV show from the 1960s. You ready? You'll know which one it is as I get into it. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man, and its dimension is as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area we call the twilight zone. Remember that? There we go. We might call heaven that. It's kind of a twilight zone for us. We don't know. We're not sure. But we know something is there. We don't get it. We can't understand it. But we are so sure that something is there. And over the next few weeks, we'll explore what the Bible tells us about heaven. Because, you know, I'm not really that interested in what the twilight zone tells us about heaven. But I'm really interested in what what the Lord says about heaven. Aren't you? I want you to get excited about this because over the next few weeks we're going to discover, we're going to roll God's plan out. I know lots of people are talking at the moment about end times and about the book of Revelation and that's great. I want to go beyond that. That's just the kickoff point. It gets better than that. And God, those who've studied it get really, really excited about this because having heaven in your heart every day means that you can see the shore and you can go hard. But that's where I'm going to leave it today. But I I need to say, if you do not know Jesus Christ, you're not a part of that. If you've never asked Jesus into your life, we need to change that immediately because we want you in heaven with us. We want you 
to stand with us on the shores of that, that great place of heaven and beyond. But some of you here, you're not sure. And some of you, you might have been in church for a long time. You might have gone to church, you might have, might have uh, been in church, you might have been in and around church, you know all the songs, you've read a bit of the Bible, but you don't have heaven in your heart. Maybe you don't, you know, the distance between heaven and hell is 16 inches, between that and that. That's the distance between heaven and hell. Get this wrong and you face an eternity separated from God. Get it right, you have an eternity with the rest of us, with the Lord. So... I just want to finish this morning. We're not going to have an appeal or anything like that. I just want to lead you in a prayer. If you've never asked Jesus into your life, this is the most important few minutes of your entire life. And I'm going to say to you, why don't you join us? You might say, I'm not really sure if I believe. That's okay. Just believe in Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, all of this follows. But it starts with you asking Jesus into your life, turning away from your sin and saying, Lord, I give you my life. So let's just bow our heads and pray. Just say these words after me. If you've never asked Jesus into your life, this is your moment. This is the greatest few minutes you will ever have in your lifetime. This changes everything. Your life that is but a breath will become something that will be glorif glorifying and, and incredible and amazing and wonderful for all eternity. So pray this, pray this prayer with me and let's make sure, if you're not sure, maybe you've been in church for a while, you're not sure, let's make sure today. I don't want anyone leaving this place and going to hell. I want everyone in this place going to heaven. So if that's you, if you're not sure, if you've never asked Jesus into your life or maybe you had but you're, you're not really sure if it took, this is the moment to get it right. Say these words with me and together. We will ask the Lord into your life and your life will change for all eternity. Say, Lord Jesus, I know that I've sinned. But right now, Lord, I turn away from my sin. And I turn to you. Forgive me, Lord. I ask you into my life as my Lord and my Savior. And thank you for giving me eternity with you. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, or you were just making sure this morning, I'm just going to ask you very quickly, put your hand up and put it down. We're not bringing you to the front. There's a few. Any more? This is it. The most important few minutes of your life, your life will change forever. Starting now. So, Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Father, that you have, you have spoken our hearts this morning. We want to get excited about, about praising you. We want to get excited about calling you Lord for all eternity. And, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts, that we would get excited enough to come back next week and explore what you have for us, what you've told us in your word, what we can expect. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on the shoreline. Help us to keep our vision on you, our thoughts on things above, not on earthly things, we pray. Lord, speak to our hearts over this week. Bring us back with expectant hearts as we explore the great truth that we will live in forever and ever and ever. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.